Talking Africa, the podcast that deconstructs the news from the continent, brought to you by the Africa Report. My name is Nicholas Norbrook. Have you had a look at our new website? You haven't? You should. You should tell us what you think. Hit us up at the Africa Report or on our Facebook page. This week on the pod, I'm joined by West Africa editor Erebo Ekbejule and our editor-in-chief Patrick Smith. We talk about where the latest results in Nigeria's elections leave us, with results from six states still delayed after what has been dubbed inconclusive results. We talk about the wide disparity between the governor and the presidential election results. We speculate about the court cases to come. Might they set precedents, as in Ghana's elections, which, while they might not help Atiku Abubakar today, may help contenders in the future. And we also lose our cool about Brexit and rally around the Algerian uprising. Erema, what, what are the, the sort of stand-back conclusions that we can take from the gubernatorial elections that have been unrolling over the last uh, you know, week, and, week or so um, since the weekend. It, it, it does seem that an interesting balance of power is emerging between the, the ruling APC and the challenger PDP. Perhaps not something that people were predicting uh, 10 days ago. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think what has happened is that um, even regardless of the irregularities in the elections, voters across the country are showing that they are um, displeased with the level of governance of their different governors. And so you, what you're saying is um, certain APC governors not getting back or the outgoing APC governors are now, um, their parties are being voted out. Then as well in the PDP, you have a couple of um, PDP governors whose states have, you know they've lost now to the APC. So for example, for example, you have Gombe that was an APC state before. It has now become a PDP state. Um, you have um, in in states like sorry that was an a PDP state before it has now become an APC state. Um, I beg your pardon. Then if if you have states like Sokoto Bauchi that are inconclusive, but just before. You know, why the results were circulated, you could see that the PDP was leading ahead. You know? So it's it's a it's almost like a balance. Even though at the center the APC regained its mandate, renewed its mandate for another four years, all right, at the various federating units, that's the states, um, the voters are beginning to show that um, they've had enough. So that that's what I think uh, was one of the major lessons that we could learn. Secondly, um, in the Northwest where Hello? We can hear you. Okay, great. Secondly, in the Northwest, where um, Kano and Sokoto, which are two of the most popular states in the Northwest and two of the most, um, you know, if you could say fanatical, if there are any um, radicals, Islamist radicals, or fanatical believers, populists, right? These two states are swinging the way of the PDP. I mean, of course, one, you have a governor who was in the APC, but has now decamped. And then the second one, you have, um, you know, an APC incumbent governor. You know, but these two states that they're moving towards the opposition tells me something that, you know, it's either Muhammad Buhari is the most popular politician dead or alive from the north since um, since the death of the Sadawana of Sokoto in 1966, who was the premier. It's either Buhari is the most popular politician since then, or Kano and Sokoto really have the most... Um, you know, they're really hotbeds of of progressive populists. Because how are they still voting for Buhari um, in the national elections, even though they're you know dis- dissatisfied with the economy and everything else? But then, two weeks later, they're voting out their governor, who is adjudged to be one of the best performing governors in the, in the region, right? But then he has this scandal of five, six videos. Um, of him stopping Dolanos, you know, and you know the people are showing that um, you know that they are progressive enough to believe 
in another populist um, leadership and also to vote out the current one. You know, it, it reminds you of the days of Aminu Kanu in the 50s and 60s and um, the mass progressive movements, movements that were in the north. Yeah, so all of these, all of these elections really just I major throwback to those days. But but Aaron, and thirdly, uh, sorry, Aaron, just let me let me just jump in because it it sounds like you're maybe slightly skeptical uh, of the presidential election vote if there is such a big disparity between what people voted in the presidential versus how they voted a week later. Well, it's a it's a mixture of two things. On the one hand, of course, you have voter suppression that didn't allow people, you know, votes, well, personal opinion, you know, voter suppression didn't allow people to vote um, in the areas that were opposition strongholds. But then secondly, you also have to go beyond just saying, and that's the popular opinion in so many places in, in, in Nigeria, especially in the South. You have to go beyond saying and thinking that Northerners are illiterate, uh, and mostly illiterate, and so they're going to just vote uh, based on popularity and populist politics. You have to realize that there is a system, you know, there's a method to the madness, right? You have to look back. For example, the Kwan Kwasia movement, that's Kwan Kwasia and his followers, they wear red caps, which is... Um, it's 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 like a memorabilia, a symbolic reference to the politics of Amino Kanu in the fifties and sixties. Because Amino Kanu used to wear red caps, and Amino Kanu was the guy who, who and whose ideals the Northern Elements Progressive Union was built. It was a formidable political party in the fifties and sixties, right? Now they advocated for more women leaders. You know, the few women you see in the north today, especially in Kanu politics, all came from Amino Kanu's brand of politics. So, in as much as people are trying to paint it as seem as though you know the illiterates that voted in uh, Buhari, you have to realize that the politics of Amino Kanu has descended, descended, and now finally crystallized, such that the people are progressive enough. To vote for change, even if it is change for another populist, I'm, you know, I'm not sure if, if that's quite clear, right? So even if it does seem like you know, a flawed decision, right? This, the people have made a decision. So in that respect, you can look back at Buhari's victory and say that um, this was one apart from irregularities. This were people deciding that we can vote across party lines. We can vote an APC guy as president, and we can vote a PDP guy as our governor. Patrick, first of all, you know, is there is there method in your own madness? And secondly, very little indeed. <laughs> secondly, what what does this say? madness in the method? <laughs> what does this say about uh, Atikun and how he may have affected politics in the region? I, I think that's a really interesting question. To me, it gets at the centre of this sequence of elections. So you have the national elections on the twenty third of February, and Mohamedou Buhari, according to the Independent National Electoral Commission wins a four million vote victory over Atiku Abubakar, who is widely regarded as one of the most serious opposition challengers just in terms of his personal fortune, the money he's put into his campaign, the the organization of his campaign, the fact he's from the north like Buhari. But he loses by four million votes. And then two weeks later, 9th of March, you have these state elections and it looks like the APC is really losing ground in a lot of different places. First of all, the the PDP, as Aroma has said, has consolidated its grip on the oil-producing Niger Delta and the southeast. You'd expect it to do that. But it's winning states in the southwest. It, it's, it's pushing uh, other states in the southwest to a much tighter contests than the ruling APC would like. It is certainly ahead in, I think, Aroma, you said, five out of the six uh, uh, suspended uh, states, or rather yes. the states where they're going to have uh, f- uh, a rerun elections, the PDP was ahead in five out of six of those, yeah? Go ahead. Yes, the PDP is ahead. The PDP is ahead in five of the six states where supplementary elections are going to be held, not reruns. Right. So supplementary elections right. are going to be held in certain local government areas, yes. Yeah, and I mean, I think the significance of that is we were talking yesterday about this and you said, look, you know, some of those are in the two or three are in the middle belt. You'd kind of expect that because of the opposition to the way the government has handled the herder farmer issue. But two, uh, Kano and Sokoto, as you just said, are in the heartland 
lands of uh, Buhari and the APC, the northwest region of Nigeria. So that is uh, to to come to such a tight result there, where they're forced to have reruns. I think is pretty significant. So uh, I, I draw a couple of conclusions from that: is that the PDP seems to have a much better game gra- um, ground game for the state elections, is much better organised. It has picked generally, with some notable exceptions, better candidates than the APC. It's a more united party, weirdly, because it was divided badly after it lost in 2015, but it's bounced back with a more united structure. Um, And I think it does raise questions about the sellability of a Tiku uh, as a candidate. And I know when at the time he won the nomination back in October 2018, a lot of wise people, I think including yourself, uh, Oromo, were saying that someone like Aminu Tambuwal speaks more to the future for the whole of Nigeria. Nigeria. He uh, he's not too poisoned by a long political corrupt. In some cases, history. Um, he is turning over a leaf. He's. Uh, in uh, league with uh, some more forward-thinking uh, politicians across uh, across the country, and I'm wondering now what uh, what the signal to Atiku is going to be uh, from uh, from the Nigerian people, but to particularly people in the PDP. Are they going to say, "Hey, I think we made a mistake"? I, let, let me let me ask you that question in particular with regards to Rivers States, Aramo, because. You know the the fight there is to for the for the APC. The fight there is to try to keep hold of uh, you know uh, an oil producing state that they can more easily carve some patronage out of. Now, obviously, very nervous that they're going to lose it. Um, What does it mean? You know, as you know, the next you know as the dust settles from from this election um, and people start to look towards. Uh, you know, electoral cycles of the future. Uh, the PDP might be the the most cohesive and well financed party. Yeah, um, I think I think the resistance that the the um, PDP is putting up to the APC in reverse um, can be seen as you know um, an atomization of what's happening nationwide. You know, so first of all, of course, you have the violence between two familiar foes who have fought on the same side and now fighting on different sides. You know to ensure that um, um, the ruling party can get hold of, of um, an oil producing state. Edo and Ondo states in the in the scheme of things, oil producing and how much. Uh, money they can return to the post to fund political campaigns are really small, small players in terms of the kind of money that Delta or Rivers or Aquipo would, would, would bring in. Um, now, um, and, and this is the kind of money that has been keeping um, the PDP afloat while it was in power and even after um, it left power. You had Wiki and Rivers single-handedly Funding the party, almost introducing the favored candidate Aminu Tambua. You know, so all of this money has been coming uh, in 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 2007. You have to remember that it was James Ibori and Delta states that literally funded the campaign of uh, Umari Aradwa, the presidency of Umari Aradwa, and that's why uh, when they got in, they could um, easily take out um, Nuhu Ribadu as chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Oil money really makes things revolve around, and so long as the PDP has access to as many oil states as possible, it will still be a formidable force. Um, James Ibori is back, you know, uh, and you have Wiki in in, in 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 what you call it now, Wiki in in River States. You have Udom who has shown that uh, you can. You know the the, the question of Akwaibom is every new Godfather that has come up, every new Godson that has come up has defeated his Godfather since '99. The recurring theme. You know, so you have a new guy in Governor Udom in Akwaibom State who is there for the PDP. So traditionally, since as long as the South South remains. Um, remains a PDP base. It is very hard to see them, the South South and 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 its its um, sibling, very closely related sibling, the Southeast. As long as they remain PDP base, so it's very very hard to see um, to see them dying. Or you know, take the example of a regional party, Abga, 
um, more progressive grand alliance. They're mostly in the southeast. If they had access to the oil money of Delta or Rivers or Fibon, they would have seen, you know, it's a, it's a very undirected path. But if they had that kind of oil money, it would have been easier for them to scale up on a larger stage, you know, like somewhat like a startup, right? So the oil money is like the venture capitalist money that helps parties stay, um, you know, stay alive, able to attract.